How do you do? If you were successful in the music business, lived in beautiful apartments in Las Vegas and Reno, drove a good car and had plenty of money, all this at the age of 22, you couldn't possibly be depressed now, could you? Well, the man we're about to meet had all of those things and more. He was also the victim of almost disabling depression until his heart and mind and life were unshackled. All right, left lunge stands towards the front. May Gary's front kick with your right leg. Ready? Kick! <laughs> kick! <laughs> kick! <laughs> All right, switch stances. Left hand out, middle block. Joe Danuki. Ready? <laughs> Buck! Right, left hand out and seeking straight punch. Ready? Punch! 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 Yes, this man has also been a karate instructor and is holder of a second degree black belt. Unshackled. Dramatized true stories produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. More than a hundred years ago, in 1877, homeless people in Chicago were forced to remain below the deadline in a sordid area of vice, along with known criminals and other undesirables. That year saw the beginning of Pacific Garden Mission as a place of refuge for the homeless. From that day to this, it's never closed, but it's become much more than a shelter. It offers lodging, Meals, clothing, and medical and dental care, all without charge. Counselors address the underlying causes of homelessness to break the pattern of defeat. The goal is not just relief, but a new life. And now for broadcast around the earth, another true story of a life unshackled. Depression seems to be an ailment of our time. Perhaps it's always been with us, unrecognized or under some other name. It's often an impersonator, mimicking the symptoms of other organic complaints. You'll learn how it came to dominate the life of a man who, by most standards, should have been very well pleased with himself. As we bring you the true story of Mike Marino, now on Unshackled. I was born into a show business family in Rockford, Illinois, in 1957. My dad played drums and my mother was a dancer. When I was a child, they ran a dance studio and I was their star pupil. When I was six, I tap danced on TV on the Ted Mack Amateur Hour. I think now that I was a lonely kid, you know, I tried several ways to compensate. In school, I had a smart guy attitude and I was the class clown. My grades were low average. In my teens, I tried drugs and drank a lot of beer. I was also active in sports, and I think for that reason, I decided that drugs weren't a good idea, but I, I didn't apply the same thinking to alcohol. Well, on a couple of occasions, I actually played high school football while drunk. Oh, I applied myself to music and to karate, and I think now that both were part of an effort to compensate for feelings of inadequacy. I taught karate for a while and then started a band. We started playing in motel lounges when I was 19, and then a couple of years later, I was hired as a bass player with the McCoys in Las Vegas. My father was pleased to hear about that, of course. Oh, I wish your mother could have lived to see this, Mike. Well, I won't be leader, of course. Oh, uh, so what? This is one time when it's better to be a small frog in a big puddle, and they don't make puddles much bigger than Las Vegas. Now, the money's better, of course. Well, I'll miss you, Mike. Especially when Fourth of July comes around. You know, Dad, as Rockford's Mr. Fourth of July, I don't think you need any help. Well, you've been the spark plug for a week of celebration for so many years, I know you can handle it by yourself. I worked in the Las Vegas Reno system for three years. During two of those years, I lived in Las Vegas, and almost anyone would have said that I was somebody to be envied. I knew, though, that something was wrong. So all of a sudden, you say, let's get in the car and go. And now I say, go where? Out in the desert, anywhere to get away from that city. That city happens to be high on the dream list for every musician in the country. Now tell me about it. What's come over you? You didn't used to be moody like this. 
I don't know what's come over me. All I know is that lately I don't feel good. So, go see a doctor. Yeah, what can I tell him? Then let me be the doctor. You tell me. Well, it seems like I'm always tired. When I should be wide awake, all I want to do is sleep. Have you been taking downers? No, nothing like that. I, I just sleep a lot more than I used to. Then, as your doctor, I can't imagine what's wrong. You see, if I talk to a doctor, he'll tell me the same thing. Oh, how do you like my new perfume? What new perfume? What new perfume? Are you trying to be funny? No. I passed one of those sample perfume bars and sprayed it on until the clerk started giving me dirty looks. I thought it would knock you down when I got into the car. Sorry, can't smell a thing. Then there really is something wrong with you, but I can't imagine what. Well, neither can I. All I know is that I feel miserable. In 1981, I was touring with a band, and we worked in a nightclub in Dickinson, North Dakota. Now, that may not sound like such a big deal, but just then, new oil wells were being brought in. Riggers with money burning holes in their pockets made Dickinson a modern version of the mining boom towns of the Old West. Most of the excitement swept right by me because of my growing depression. Oh, well, the onset was gradual, first one symptom and then another. After the desire to sleep most of the time when I wasn't working came the loss of senses of taste and smell. Then came a feeling of unreality. After I did my show, I'd go up to my room, and often I'd lock myself in the bathroom. I also began to experience chest pains, and during that time these symptoms were coming on, the leader of our band mentioned something to me that was to have a deep influence in my life. Well, Mike, one more set and we're finished for the night. Well, that doesn't make me feel sad. Nah, me either. When these oil guys party, they really go all out. Man, I don't know how they do it. They work hard all day, and then they tear the town apart at night. Nah, I think my wife's afraid I might try to live the way they do. Oh? Yeah, I got a letter from her today, and she told me I ought to watch a TV program she thinks would do me good. Are you going to watch it? Or... Nah, probably not. Hey, why don't you check it out and tell me what you think? It's called the 700 Club. What time? What channel? Yeah, I can't help you there. You must be listening to the local paper, though. I found the listing, and when the program came on, I was watching it. I saw and heard people who told how they had run their lives into the ground and then received Christ as their Lord and Savior. They said they'd been given a new life, and it seemed clear to me that they were speaking from the heart. And then Pat Robertson spoke right into the camera and to me. The Bible is right, as always, when it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the world has some very strange ideas about sin. One is to deny the reality of sin by using words like mistake or making a misstep. Another is to deny that anything is a sin so long as it is done in love, whatever that means. Now read the ads for films and you'll get the idea that sin has a very narrow definition and is also attractive. You know, a man said to me recently, I'm not a sinner. I don't need to worry about hell. After all, I've never killed anyone. But look at the first commandment. It is thou shalt have none other gods before me. The person who puts wealth ahead of reverence to God has violated that commandment. So is the one who puts power first or popularity or anything else. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we accept him and his sacrifice by faith, we're forgiven and then, because he rose from the grave and lives, we also shall live. If you're ready to receive Jesus Christ, the Son of God, by faith, you may now do so. There's no set formula, but countless people have used these words, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And save me for Jesus' sake, amen. And save me for Jesus' sake, amen. That was the first time I had ever understood the gospel, and I knew it was what I was looking for. My decision was real, but then what? I didn't even know one person who had ever made a similar decision. I watched that same program almost every time it was on, and each time as it ended, I repeated those same words. Meanwhile, my physical condition, if it was physical, was unchanged. When I did a tour of Europe for the Defense Department in a USO show, I grew worse. 
It came to the point where I was seeing an army or an Air Force doctor at every post or air base where we performed. Once I spent a very short time in the military hospital at Wiesbaden. On such a brief examination, I can't account for the chest pains. Well, what about the headaches, Doctor? I mean, they're real skull splitters. Well, I don't want to frighten you, but the cause could be serious. How serious? Well, we at least have to consider the possibility of a brain tumor. You're right. That frightens me. Oh, we can't know, of course, without extensive testing. Well, I really haven't time for that now. We're supposed to leave for Turkey tomorrow. Uh, let me uh, suggest this. If the symptoms get any worse, give up your tour and go home. <laughs> Well, the symptoms did get worse, and I decided to take the doctor's advice and go home. I had to wait in Ankara, where I was met by a Turkish liaison officer who really went out of his way to be helpful. In fact, he took me home for a dinner. When he put me on the Turkish airline plane to Istanbul, he assured me that I'd be met there by an American liaison person, and that information turned out to be wrong. The American failed to show up. I had my tickets, but was faced with an overnight stay before taking a morning flight from Istanbul to Frankfurt. At least I had the name of a good hotel, so I was able to tell the Turkish taxi driver where to go. He's not much farther to Hotel Shina. Good. Uh, driver, I don't have much Turkish money. Can you take American money? Not, not, not take paper money. I take American coin. Well, then I better see how many of those I've got. Seems like I've got quite a few quarters. Each one is 25 cents. Quarters? Uh, okay, I, I take them. Whatever was wrong with me, the symptoms were growing more severe. A new one had nothing to do with pain. It was fear. Fear of nothing definite, just an overpowering feeling of apprehension. After checking into my room, I found I hated being alone, so I went down to the dining room, and the fear went right along with me. <laughs> God, I've never felt like this in my life. Man, I'm scared, just plain scared. And I don't know why. I need help, Lord. I don't know if I'm losing my mind or not. Maybe I'm going to die. Please, help me in Jesus' name. Amen. It was all I could do to go back to my room. Now there was something new to deal with. In the past, my trouble had been wanting to sleep all the time. Well, that night I discovered that I couldn't sleep at all. The next morning I faced my next ordeal at the Ankara airport. I found myself in a long line of people, almost all of them Turkish, who were going to Istanbul. During the hour I stood in line, I really expected to fall down dead. At last I reached the head of the line and an official in uniform stuck out his hand and demanded my passport. I take passport, you wait. Yeah, but, uh, but my plane leaves in a few minutes. You wait. That really left me terrified. At the last minute, the agent came back and handed me the passport, and I was allowed to board the plane. Well, the rest of that trip was a nightmare, but a nightmare without sleep. Uh, my route took me from Istanbul to Frankfurt on Lufthansa, and there I changed to a Pan Am flight for New York. Stewardess, how many more hours? Oh, we'll be on the ground at JFK in just over three hours. So long? Why don't you sleep for a while? Sleep? I wish I could. Maybe if I brought you a nice pillow. Uh, thanks, but uh, it won't help. Do you have some kind of sleeping pill or... I'm sorry, sir. We're not allowed to dispense drugs. Would a drink help? No, I guess I'll just uh, have to sit it out. Mike was very clearly a man in trouble. We'll learn how serious that trouble really was. Now here's Superintendent Dave Saul near of Pacific Garden Mission to share an excerpt from a recently arrived letter. Jack, this one says, I started listening to your program by accident. One evening when I started work, I turned the radio dial and heard you. Now I listen every day. There are times when I feel down in spirit 
But when I hear your program, I realize how blessed I am to have a Savior who died for me and for everyone else on the cross at Calvary. Some of my co-workers listen, too. A good letter, and I especially like that last statement. You mean some of my co-workers listen, too? Right. I hope many people are using the program to reach others. Dave, this letter says I'm 47 years old, and I have listened to your program since I was a small boy. I believe it helped me to get saved. And that's the point of Unshackled. It reaches around the earth to help bring people to Christ. We know we have many listeners in West Africa. Here's a letter from Monrovia, Liberia. When I first started gaining interest in the program, I introduced it to my mother. As time went on, I then introduced it to my brother. Now that I'm married, I've introduced it to my wife. If God permits, we hope to introduce it to our children when they have grown. Well, letters like these are tremendously encouraging. They let us know how the Lord uses the program. Friend, have we heard from you? Your letter will be very welcome. When you write, tell us a little about yourself, just as these people have done. Address Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois, 60605. Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois, 60605. <laughs> New York to Chicago and still no sleep. You know, the first thing I did after reaching Rockford was go to a hospital for two weeks of tests. All of them came back negative. Then I spent two more weeks in the University Hospital at Madison, Wisconsin. More tests and still more tests. Well, the answers were all the same, negative. And then I was sent to a psychiatrist. Mike, it's uh, been suggested that there's an anxiety component. What do you think about it? Well, I'm inclined to agree. Can anything be done about it? Oh, I think so. I'm going to start you on uh, antidepressants. We'll have to balance them, of course, with a carefully measured medication with tranquilizers. It sounds good to me. Anything to put an end to the things that I've been going through. After three weeks of the medication, I felt normal. Then I was ready to pick up with the music business again. I teamed up with a partner and we formed a band. It was very successful almost from the beginning and I found myself making more money than ever. Most of our work was at border resorts and on cruise ships and even so I, I found myself increasingly dissatisfied. In 1984, at a time when we were booked more than a year ahead, we completed a tour that ended in Madison and Rockford and it was then that I made the decision to leave the music business. Well, my partner thought I had lost my mind, but I, I was very sure that this was the right thing to do. My hometown just felt right to me, and I was able to pick up my old job as a karate teacher. One of my students was Leonard James, senior pastor of a large church. All right, Leonard, keep your hands up. Hands up now. Bend your knees. Bend your knees. Drop that right hand now. Smack it. Let's hear it. Work now. Work underneath. Work. Bend your knees. All right, that's enough for today, Leonard. Good job. Uh, I can go some more if you, if you like, Mike. Hey, I don't doubt it. By the way, you know, you're making very good progress. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want the young guys in my church to think I tried to learn martial arts and <laughs> couldn't cut it. <laughs> hey, the way you're going, you won't have to tell them you're good. You can show them. Uh, are there a lot of young people in your church? <sighs> Uh, more than more than I'd have thought possible a few years ago, but but still not as not as many as I'd like, you know. I've been meaning to ask you something, Mike. Um, uh, are you a Christian? Well, I know I'm a Christian, and God knows it, but I don't think anybody else does. Uh, you know, the, the Bible says, "Let the redeemed of the Lord say so." Uh, it, it also says, "Confess Jesus with thy mouth." Now, you're not ashamed to talk to people about the Lord, are you? Not ashamed of the Lord, ashamed of my ignorance. You know, in three years I've had no contact with other Christians. Well, the Bible warns us against forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Hey, I, I haven't forsaken it. I never begun it. <laughs> no wonder you haven't grown. Now, I'd like to put you in touch with a man who can help you to get established in a church. Is it okay with you if I call him? Hey, go ahead. I tell him to call you and you can set up an appointment for lunch. Uh, his name is Mike Williams. Huh. 
But we have several things in common. One of them is music. I'm pastor of music at our church. Well, then I guess I should feel right at home. I hope so. I'll be up on the platform during the service, but I'll be watching for you. When I took him up on his invitation, I was late arriving and the service was already in progress. When I opened the door, though, I felt as if I was coming home, a definite spiritual experience. You know, the presence of the Holy Spirit hit me right in the face. Man, this was reality. Well, that was the beginning of growth that had been stunted for three years. It began with Bible study, and then I learned the importance of a quiet time at the beginning of the day. I began to wonder if I really needed the medication that I was taking regularly, and I decided to try to wean myself away from it. Well, I reduced my dosage, and the old symptoms began to appear, and then I thought a heavy exercise program might help. At the same time, I cut off all my medication, and the result was disappointing, almost frightening, and I discussed it with another Christian. So you're having headaches, chest pains, and all the other symptoms that forced you to give up your tour in Europe, huh? Right, and I blame myself for it. Why? I think the problem is I just don't have enough faith. And you think that if you had more faith, you'd experience a sort of miracle. That's it. Mike, miracles are God's business, not ours. And faith isn't our business either. <laughs> faith isn't like muscle building. We, we can't develop it in our own strength. Faith is a gift of God. If you worked up a lot of faith or, or whatever you thought was faith and then experienced some kind of healing, it would be very easy to fall into spiritual pride. If God wants you to get along without the medication, he'll do it in his own good time. Don't run ahead of the Lord. Well, are you saying that I won't ever be healed? No, no, no. I'm just saying to, to trust more and push less. Now, let's suppose you were a diabetic. Would you believe God could heal you? Sure. Why? With God, all things are possible. That's right. But would you continue to take insulin to avoid going into shock until you were healed? I keep taking it. Then do it. Take your medication, but keep praying and trusting God. I went back to the medication, and my withdrawal symptoms left me. Meanwhile, I prayed for healing. Three weeks went by, and then as I reached for the bottle of pills, God spoke to me very clearly. The message was, you don't need to take those anymore. Well, I put the bottle away and have never used the medication since then. More than three years later, I can still say, no pills and no symptoms. Well, to me, the lesson is clear. Pray for healing, but don't demand it. We're here to serve God, not for him to serve us. During all this time, I had avoided dating for fear I might do it unrighteously. Then, during a Bible study, a young woman told of her experience with a problem that is increasingly common. The doctors have a name for it, bulimia. It's a particular form of gluttony, compulsive eating. Stuff yourself, put a finger down your throat, and then stuff yourself all over again. You're addicted to food, just as others may be addicted to drugs or alcohol. It's a secret addiction, and you're terribly ashamed of it. I was a food addict, and I've been set free by the grace of God. In the old days, when I was in Las Vegas, I never had any hesitation about approaching a woman. But now, although I wanted to get to know Gail, I actually lacked the courage to ask for a date. Instead, I took another approach. You want me to work for you? Doing what? Well, a uh, 4th of July is coming up, and it's always been a very big occasion in my family, and a lot of people, you know, call my dad Mr. 4th of July. And, well, I'm, I'm opening a soft drink stand for the parade and the fireworks display. I need help, and, and you seem just right for the job. No hot dogs? No hot dogs. Then I guess the job is safe. I wouldn't want to eat up all the profits. Gail and I were married in February of 1986. Another good thing happened, too. The owner of the karate school came back from another job and took over. 
so I had to look for another job. Now I'm an announcer on the staff of WQFL. That's a Christian radio station in Rockford. And one of the programs we broadcast is Unshackled. The years in the music business haven't been wasted either. Doors are opening for me to be active in contemporary Christian music. This is an unusual program in the Unshackled series in that the voice of Mike Marino is exactly that. Mike is playing the part of Mike Marino. Mike, if you had one full minute to speak right from the heart, what would you say? Well, Jack, I found it to be true that you cannot sink low enough in life that the love of God through Christ can't reach underneath you and pluck you out of the pit. You know, we battle against so many things in this life. My battle was depression. But whether it's depression or divorce or loneliness, drugs and alcohol, physical abuse, molestation, it doesn't matter. It's the same Christ who will deliver you. He cannot lie, and he will not fail you. And he's available to you right now. Don't spend one more empty minute. I say go to Christ, and I promise that you'll never regret it. Thank you, Mike. Friend, to learn more about the living Lord Mike speaks of, you may get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois, 60605. The telephone number in Chicago, area 312-922-1462. If you listen in the Philippines, you may address Unshackled in care of the Pacific Mission. Post Office Box 1467 Manila. We enjoy hearing from those who listen, so we'd appreciate a letter from you. As you listen, ask others to do so, too. Also, what about a note to the manager of this radio station to say, thanks for Unshackled. Heard in the true story of Mike Marino were Mike himself, Felice Polly, Bob O'Donnell, Matt DeCaro, Jack Bivens, and Drake Collier. Original music, Lucille Becker. Sound, Nicolosio. Engineer, Ed Webb. I'm Jack O'Dell, and I've written the story as Mike told it to me. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Write this week if you can. Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois, 60605. For counsel, you may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, area 312-922-1462. Someone who's concerned is waiting for your call. 312-922-1462.